Pyvax Vision, AKX headset, the good, the bad, the ugly, the understandable. Not quite literally, more of a balanced point by point technical analysis based on hundreds of hours of experience in this headset and in thousands of hours in VR generally. So not a on the spot review or anything like that. Especially this will be focused on virtual desktop, overlay, flight sim, and similar applications that benefit the most from readability and immersion. Also, this particular unit is not necessarily the final version that will be shipped to other customers. Pimax may still make additional improvements. A bit of a disclaimer here, this is unbiased. I don't really have any conflicts of interest. The VR industry is a diverse mix of small companies that work together, so it probably would not be in my best interest to be biased to any one of them. While I am interested in working with Pimax, that is because of the strength of their hardware and the team that created it. That said, I am grateful for early access to this AKX unit for evaluation and testing. That has given me a couple weeks head start optimizing my spreadsheets and also demonstrated that GPU rendering requirements drop off precipitously as display resolution increases. Any real bias I may have is because these headsets fit me particularly well. I'm probably in the top 50th percentile. The sweet spot of the lenses lines up with my eyes particularly well. The foam that is used fits me probably uniquely well. So I may have a bit of an advantage there. Also, one thing that I am not testing with these headsets is any kind of destructive testing. I'm not feeling really hard for weak spots. I'm not trying to make this unit creak. There probably aren't any replacements in existence if it breaks and it's a very useful piece of equipment for me so I'm not really inclined to take any risks. Nonetheless, there are many good reasons to expect these headsets are quite robust. The headsets that we're using now, they come from CES and the Roadshow where they have been through extremely difficult conditions. They've been yanked at, the cables have been stepped on, they've been dropped a few times at least, they've been on hundreds of people's heads, they have been power cycled many times, and this one has at least a couple hundred hours on it by now. The good. Resolution is at the top of the list. This is what VR should be. It's as much of a step up from the 5K Plus as the 5K Plus was from the Oculus CV1 or the original Vive. It's 50 to 75% better both in terms of what you can read and in terms of making the things that you could read before more readable, less eye strain. Case in point, using virtual desktop. Yes, you could get a decent triple monitor, 4K workstation set up in virtual desktop, equivalent to having a few 65-inch screens around you with the 5K+. Plus. But with the 8KX, it's comfortable enough that at least I can do that all day and get the kind of work done that I would normally do on a triple monitor workstation where I have a lot of thinking to do on code. Uh, in addition to the more qualitative, this is what is more comfortable to do, I've done an actual Snellen test. There were some problems with it. I couldn't do a precise eye exam chart with the uh, test applications for VR headsets because they just would not render in full resolution and I couldn't do anything about it at the time. But I did manage to scale it approximately the same as on a physical monitor that I had in front of me stand at approximately the correct distance with some angular size calculations and whatnot. And the AKX is close to 2020 vision. The previous generation headsets, all of them, are not even close to that. And this affects what you can do. In Flight Sim, in particular, 
you need to see a real flight deck. You're looking at, let's say, an F-18, and you're looking at a color display with a moving map and some green text on top of that map. It's going to be difficult at best to read the green text on top of that background with the 5K+. Plus. With the with anything less than the 5K+, plus, like an Oculus or a Vive, it might be readable sometimes, it just might not be readable at all. With the AKX, it's a completely different situation. There are very few times when the lighting conditions are such that you can't just look down, glance at the display, in less than a quarter of a second, read off your current ground speed and true airspeed, and then go back to what you were doing. Uh, more of the instrumentation that you would have in a flight simulator is actually readable because these headsets are now approaching the limits of human vision instead of some arbitrary constraint imposed by their displays. Also, for me, I kind of measure this in continuous productive hours. For me, usually I was able to do something in VR for four days, 40 hours total. And now I can do that for eight days to 96 hours. That might seem a bit excessive if you're thinking of it in terms of VR gaming, of course. But keep in mind that a lot of the posts that I have sent to the Pimax forums recently were written from inside the headset because I could go keep an eye on that, interact with that website as I wanted to in virtual desktop or in an overlay panel, go back to a VR app or go back to a VNC remote desktop projection of my Linux workstation which of course is really nice because text works pretty well on Linux. Point is though that if you want to read things quickly or you're going to spend a lot of time in VR, you really need to have this high resolution. Of course, there are also less critical benefits that really go a long way. You look at a complex object like an aircraft, like the FA-18, or you look at scenery, trees, grass, things like that. They suddenly seem a whole lot more real just because you're not looking at some computer-generated jagged line. You're looking at detailed textures showing variations in the paint characteristics. You're looking at the finer details of the leaves. You're looking at these things behind and around the leaves themselves. So it's great for immersion. It's necessary for more serious uh, use cases of VR. And it extends the amount of time that you can tolerate VR. There is also an upscaler. So if for any reason you're thinking, oh, well, I need an 8K plus because my graphics hardware is older you can get that out of the AKX. If you're only going to get one VR headset, there is no reason it shouldn't be the AKX. Uh, the next thing that's sort of a nice thing about Pimax headsets in general is field of view. This for me was a matter of how long I had been in VR. For the first 500 hours, at least, I was using an Oculus CV1. And I was even using things like OVR drop panels in that. And of course that wasn't very comfortable to do from a resolution point of view. But the real point is that for the first 500 hours, I didn't really care too much about the field of view, especially for the first 10 hours. Just the first 10 hours in VR got into the training simulations in Elite Dangerous and I was phenomenally amazed by just how much there was the feel of being in a vehicle that would actually turn and burn and move. Uh, that, that motion perception that you get from VR in the first 10 hours is amazing. But after 500 hours, I was starting to feel like, yeah, I'm aware of the black areas around my vision. It's like 
I'm not uh, solely paying attention to what I'm seeing. I'm also aware of what I'm not seeing. And that gets to be, I wouldn't say it's terribly uncomfortable, but it's certainly, it's, it's at a minimum immersion breaking. I would say it's a little worse than immersion breaking. So the Pimax headsets solve that problem, which is awesome. The AKX doesn't solve that problem more so than the 5K Plus, of course. It's the same field of view. But I don't feel like I'm ever going to need more field of view than the AKX has. It's pretty close to peripheral vision. So, yeah, that's just a feature that is something that is also what VR should be. Uh, one, there is only one case where, where the wider field of view has been more than helping with a sense of motion or eliminating the sense of things not being where they should be. And that is one case in flight sim. It's, it really is kind of a bug, but sometimes you'll try to hold down a switch that you'll be looking at and you can't really look away because that'll change where the, uh, the cursor is. So you're holding out a switch with a cursor and then you can glance over at the edge and you can see an indicator light actually did change in response to that switch. Kind of rare, but it does prove the point that in situations where you actually have to be watching two things at once, the wider field of view does help with that. Distortion. This is actually a good thing. The distortion on the AKX is lower than it has ever been. The this, there are really two kinds of distortion that I see in the AKX, that are, both of which are very hard to notice. You have to be looking specifically for them. Edge distortion and a sort of geometric distortion. The edge distortion, it's the fisheye effect that you would see in the 5K+. Plus. That did improve over time in the 5K+. Plus. By now, it's much less than it used to be, at least for me, probably because of both software improvements and because I become used to it. But the edge distortion in the 5K Plus currently is still worse than the edge distortion in the AKX, which is practically not there. You have to really look for it. You have to pick some sort of object that has a straight line, like maybe the uh, best example is probably uh, in a flight sim, you're looking at the shoreline through the cockpit. A little bit more uh, obvious of an example is if you just drew a straight line across the display and you rotate your head side to side while looking at that edge, then you might see that edge distort in a fisheye kind of pattern. It's, it's negligible in the AKX. The, the blur that you get towards the extreme edge of the lens, that's going to show up before the edge distortion does. It's, it's not significant. The geometric distortion is a little bit more significant, but you have to be looking for it. It's not something that you're going to notice just using the headset. That's a case of you take virtual desktop, you put some sort of regular pattern on there kind of like a kaleidoscope, and you look at the pattern and one, one place, actually it's better if you do it with two images, uh, two separate images of the pattern. And if you look at that image and you pan your head across that image, as it moves from one side of the display to the other, it will subtly change shape. It'll change the depth of various points on that shape. It's, it's subtle, it's not something to worry about. Reduced GPU requirements. This is one of the more surprising sort of discoveries that's happened is that because the amount of super sampling you need is less when you have real pixels, the amount of GPU load goes down very quickly to get the same visual quality. And to really illustrate this takes a takes a comparison of a few different scenarios. 
So let's say that you are rendering at 2160 vertical pixels, which is the native resolution of the 8KX. That's, that would be equivalent to putting in 3840 by 2160 in Steam VR video resolution and Steam VR application resolution and setting a game like Elite Dangerous to have HMD quality of 1.0 and super sampling of 1.0 so that there's no super sampling happening here. That's what I call a total super resolution of 1.0 for that headset. So total super resolution of 1.0 for the Pimax AKX is the same number of rendered pixels as a total super resolution of 1.5 for the Pimax 5K Plus. The difference in visual quality between those things, people who have seen native resolution sent to the Pimax Vision AKX are amazed at how clear it is, how little haze there is, how little blur there is around the bright HUD text and something like Elite Dangerous. People who see 1.5x in the Pimax 5K Plus, that's not even close to its point of diminishing returns. Um, ideally, you would be running that at 2.0 total super resolution. It's, it's chunky. It's not um, it's not crisp. The edges of the text are going to smear multiple physical pixels across. There's going to be noticeable haze. The, the single pixel wide uh, vector lines drawn on, say, the, uh, the, the um, when you're flying around in Super Cruise or something like that, the orbit lines for the stars are going to be fuzzy in the 5k plus at that super resolution. In fact, they're going to be fuzzy at any super resolution. Now, the thing is, you're spending the same amount of cost and you're getting a far inferior result on the lower resolution headset. This effect becomes much more dramatic when you actually get to the point of diminishing returns. For the 5k plus, that would be a total super resolution of 2.0 at least, really about 2.175, but just for round numbers saying 2.0 before say the green text on the moving map in the F18 um, display starts to become much more readable. 2.0 total super resolution is twice as many pixels rendered as to get the same is to get a better visual quality actually out of the AKX at its native resolution. So this means that you could end up spending twice the number of rendered pixels to get a worse visual quality result in the lower resolution headset. That's that does actually scale linearly to things like frame rate and how much you would want to push the clock on your GPU, uh, boost clock, uh, core clock actually, how much further you want to push that. So that's like having SLI in the machine. Being able to get that kind of benefit by having a high resolution display, that's perhaps as beneficial as being able to get two RTX 2080 Ti cards, put them in SLI in the same machine and use that for VR. We can't do that at the moment, but that's the kind of benefit that you would get. It can be the difference between being able to run with smart smoothing on or not having to use smart smoothing at all. It can be the difference between having one or two frames of latency, which in competitive scenarios can be a big deal. So if you're thinking, well, I don't have a great GPU, I will get the AK Plus because it has fewer pixels, so it won't take as much GPU power to render to it. That's not the case. And especially if you're thinking, well, just render at exactly the resolution of the AK Plus. Actually, you don't get any benefit from doing that. In traditional desktop gaming, where you're projecting onto a two-dimensional monitor, 
the HUD text and graphics can have that benefit because they can be aligned exactly to the pixels on your display. But a HUD rendered in VR is going to be a texture, whether it's transparent or not, is going to be a texture that is rendered in 3D space and the pixels on that texture will never line up precisely with the displays in the VR headset. So you don't get that one pixel on a font gets rendered to a single pixel in the display and it looks sharp. It will be spread across multiple pixels unless there's some super sampling. So no, you can't, you can't get any benefit from rendering it exactly the native resolution of the headset. Mathematically, the fact that these loads change so much as you increase super sampling a little bit and that, that makes such a difference between a higher resolution and lower resolution headset. That makes sense partly because the number of pixels that have to be rendered goes up with the square of the super sampling. You render twice as many pixels per inch, you're going to have four times as many pixels to render, but it's actually a little bit worse than that for wide field of view headsets because the displays are rectangular, so it's actually a little bit more than the square of the number of pixels on one axis. Of course, you can change the field of view, but it's a nice thing to have. So just higher resolution headsets are better. That's, that's the bottom line. Another good thing about Pimax headsets is Pi Tool. There are some really great workarounds in there. You can control the resolution of the headset that is presented to Steam VR. Um, I don't remember being able to do that with Oculus Rift. I, not, that it, not that I'm sure that it mattered. Uh, you may be able to do that with Windows Mixed Reality. I currently don't work with those. But PyTool is a nice interface where you can just set some things the way you want them to be set. And that does give you more control. Case in point, Steam VR does apply some kind of blur in the pipeline. It could be that there's an actual blur filter to minimize certain artifacts. It could be that they used a sync instead of a bicubic downsample filter somewhere in the pipeline. But in any case, if you push render quality to 1.25, which causes Steam VR to see a higher resolution headset to output to, then that blur filter is overcome. So PyTool gives you some workarounds like that. And PyTool, you do have to know which version to get. Um, but if you have the right version and your NVIDIA drivers are up to date, it just works for the most part. And that's that's not something that can be said of, say, Steam VR or Oculus for various reasons. Another plus of Pimax headsets is that there is a Pimax developer platform, and that allows applications to send their data directly to the headset without using Steam VR or Oculus. I haven't worked with that myself, but I know that this works because the PyTool itself has a PyTool VR Home uh, program, which creates a basic three-dimensional environment. Imagine if that was virtual desktop. That would be, and eventually that will happen one way or another, but that would be an amazing capability because no matter what happens to the whole complex software stack, you could hit a button, a macro key, or issue a voice command or something to reset the entire system, and you would be back to your graphical con back to your graphical console, even if you didn't actually have physical monitors plugged in. You could have a headless computer plugged into headless ghost, no physical monitors, just a completely portable setup, and you would always be able to you would always know that you would be able to turn on the machine put the headset on and you would be able to start all the support applications you need, uh, joystick profiles, voice recognition software, everything you need to launch your game or a simulator or VR application, whatever it is. And if that didn't work, you could go back to that console.
So that's that's something to look forward to in the future. Also, it is worth considering how Pimax Vision AKX compares to some of the competitors. In terms of resolution, the only consumer product that I'm aware of that's a competitor is the HP Reverb. So for virtual desktop, flight sim, it's the only other headset that I would consider. For that reason, I would be very interested in trying it. Unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity. VR Gamer Dude, though, has reported some things about the HP Reverb and made some comparisons. Notably, he seemed to find some sort of lens center distortion. I can say that the Pimax AKX doesn't have anything like what he's describing, but again, it'd be really interesting to see that. The Valve Index is another competitor worth mentioning, partly because it's more adjustable, and some people do seem to prefer the Valve Index over Pimax headsets. One thing I did notice in my limited experience with the Valve Index was there were more of the rays coming from the center of the headset, more of the Fresnel lens rays effects. So there's that. Also, it felt like wearing blinders again too, so it doesn't have the wide field of view. There are a couple other data points to consider with the Pimax Vision AKX. Refresh rate has attracted quite a bit of interest. In synthetic scenarios like Beat Saber, yeah, it might make a difference, and the upscaler might be worth using for that. I'm not sure that you need a 160 hertz or higher refresh rate, I'd say. I think for most purposes, I would prefer the AKX more than enough to sacrifice a little bit of frame rate performance for in something like Beat Saber. For Pavlov VR, that's a more diverse use case, which has both synthetic and organic competitive uses to consider. In the synthetic case, best way to get a feel for the difference that refresh rate can make is to use a holographic site, go through the training uh, range that's part of the lobby area now and see what your time is both with the upscaler on at higher resolution, excuse me, higher refresh rate and with the upscaler off at higher resolution. There will be a noticeable difference in how it feels, but in terms of whether it affects your time, probably not unless you're trying to get the very top score on the leaderboard and comparing with the results that others are achieving on YouTube at the top end. In more organic competitive situations, I am fairly skilled myself and I doubt that even a single extra victory could be claimed within a few days based on the refresh rate. Uh, I don't think the refresh, I don't think a higher refresh rate would correspond to a significant competitive advantage there. There is a forum, there is a thread on the Pimax forums about this. There is one case where refresh may, might make a difference. Onward uh, apparently is still using refresh rate for physics calculations. I haven't tried it in a while, but if it is, then that might be considered a very unfair advantage to be running at a lower frame rate. And for that reason, you might have to run the headset at 90 Hertz just to, just to be fair. Uh, another question that has come up from time to time is whether existing hardware is up to the job. It's true that an i9 9900K and RTX 2080 Ti can be pushed to the absolute limits by some of the flight sim scenarios. Probably the most demanding is the 476 Netter mission, which has a lot of scripted objects in DCS world. Aside from that, the CPU is usually not going to be under as much stress as the GPU. And the GPU is the GPU and C CPU in every use case I've come across so far are adequate to 
get to 1.5 times super sampling in the uh, Pimax Vision AKX. So yes, current hardware is up to the job. The bad, well, not really bad, just par for the course with the current VR technology that can possibly be put together in a consumer product. Case in point, adaptation time. It will take a little while for most people to see full optical clarity in the AKX. I suspect that this is due to versions accommodation conflict. That is, I don't think that previous generations of VR headsets challenged our reflexes to be fine tuned with the higher resolution to get the focus just right, given that we are seeing stereoscopic objects presented at closer distances than the optical focusing of the lenses is providing us. So just keep that in mind that on day one, if you're one of the people who doesn't get the best results on day one, don't be disappointed. It may just take you a little while to get used to it. Give it six hours, should improve 20%. Take a break for three hours the next day. You know, Don't start early in the morning, and by then you should start to see an improvement if that's the issue. Black level, I think this is overblown. The AKX does have better black levels and much better color quality than the 5K+. Plus. But the black level of the AKX is not the order of magnitude difference that is seen in measurement between LCD and OLED-based VR displays today. This is not going to show up in very many use cases. Take Elite Dangerous. Fly up to, I think, 1,500 light years above the bubble before the stars really get scarce and look in the direction away from the bubble where there's mostly a few stars, some interstellar gas, and large patches of pitch black. Even at the lowest gamma settings in Elite Dangerous, which are not ideal, uh, you would want higher gamma settings anyway, but even in the most difficult scenario for the headset, the pitch black regions look pitch black, the interstellar dust clouds look relatively bright gray. The next patch of interstellar dust cloud looks about the same amount of brightness relative to the previous two levels of blackness. The stars look the way they should right next to black areas. And that's a fairly organic use case. You have tiny bright objects, stars. You have large patches of various gradients of gray with soft edges, followed by regions of pitch black, and it all looks exactly as it should. Where the black levels do become noticeable is when the entire surroundings are almost completely black, and at that point, any amount of light that gets through is going to start to look gray. Flight sim, night, moonless, on a carrier deck, pitch black. Yeah, you will see that the black levels are not black. It will look fairly bright gray at that point. That's a pretty extreme case though. Um, Aside from that, I'm having a hard time imagining use cases where the black levels would actually be noticeable at all. Comfort. Well, the comfort of the AKX is relatively excellent. Everyone at the roadshow at CES seemed to think that the modular audio strap was extremely well balanced. It's very nice in terms of its features. It has is large uh, bracket sort of uh, arch that goes over the ears rather than covering the ears. It grabs at the back of the head towards the lower uh, towards the lower angle so that you're really grabbing more towards here which puts more of the pressure 
towards the front of the foam and toward, instead of towards the nose, which is definitely preferable. It's also amazing how well balanced it felt considering that there were no counterweights or anything like that. Like with the Deluxe Audio strap for the Vive, I do usually attach a, a D-cell battery as a counterweight. With the Montreal Audio strap, I don't think that would be anywhere near as necessary. However, I don't have the Modular Audio strap myself right now, so the amount of time I spent with it is limited. The reason I put comfort in the category of bad in spite of the headset being relatively excellent is because in absolute terms, whereas the resolution of the AKX and the field of view of the AKX are where VR should be, comfort of the uh, headset isn't quite where it should be. If you think about it in terms of virtual reality and the science fiction sense, ideally you wouldn't even be aware of the headset being there unless you really try to pay attention to it. That said, it's, it's to the point where I used to be able to get only four hours, excuse me, four days and 40 hours roughly in the Oculus CV1 usually a bit less than that before by like the fourth day I'd be to the point where I'd be only getting an hour of anything done for every two hours spent in the headset and it was just time to stop with the AKX I can push that to eight days and 96 hours at least without finding myself just becoming fatigued with the use of VR Partly that's because of the lack of ice cream, but that is partly because even with this fabric strap, which actually fits me pretty well, it's, it is an improvement in comfort. Still, it's there. Another problem with wearing a VR headset is that if your eyes start to itch and you want to do something about that, that means taking the headset off, putting it back on, and hoping that optical alignment is reasonably quick and easy to establish. Having a higher resolution headset and having the modular audio strap does help with that, but it's still what it is. Adjustability. There are some reports that the Valve Index is more adjustable. There are some users that find the Valve Index works better for them. For 85% of users at CES and the Roadshow, they seem to find the AKX to have about the degree of optical clarity that I did, and they found it comfortable. I think that 99% of the other 15% of users account for those who prefer the Valve Index. I haven't spent a lot of time in the Valve Index, so I haven't really worked with those adjustability settings. To be fair, even if I did have the Valve Index and spend some time with it, I might not be able to notice the difference simply because the Pimax headsets fit me particularly well. The ugly. Uh, obviously not a term to be taken literally, kind of a strong word, but these are issues that end users need to be aware of. Steam VR. If you're doing something simple like room scale applications only, then maybe you won't have as many problems with it. If you're doing things like I am, like running multiple OVR drop panels for multiple monitors because you want to be able to put multiple monitors in your virtual environment and just right places, you might have more problems with SteamVR. I have a thread on the Pimax forums that I post to every time SteamVR breaks. If it goes 60 days without a post, that thread will close automatically. I don't think it's going to close anytime soon. Oculus, I remember Oculus being down for a day. I don't know if there's an offline mode or if those kinds of issues could happen today. But my first instinct would be that if I was going to do something professional, like use virtual desktop with a laptop while I was traveling, 
I probably wouldn't rely on Oculus just because of the possibility it might go down or it might not be able to get an internet connection. Overclocking. This is not as intimidating as it sounds, and that's the reason it's on this list. When you buy a GPU, the GPUs are not just RTX 2080 Ti and that's it. There are factory overclocked GPUs, and that implies to me that the car that's sold with a factory clock of 1500 megahertz instead of the car that's sold with the factory overclock of 1900 megahertz is actually a binned chip. And what that means is that when you download the manufacturer's software for EVGA, that would be EVGA Precision X1, and you set the power target and the voltage target to max, then the card that was more expensive, you can set that to 2000 megahertz and unless it's a defective card, it should just work. That's very important because even the difference between 1950 megahertz and 2000 megahertz can be the difference between something like Elite Dangerous stuttering as you're on approach to a planetary landing and the Pimax AKX headset at 1.25 times its native resolution. So know what you're buying and make sure to download the program to overclock that card. It's not really overclocking. If it's a decent manufacturer, then you're not going to void your warranty or anything. It's just a few extra steps that you have to go to to get the performance that you actually should get out of that card. Also keep in mind that even if it was overclocking, even if it wasn't completely stable, the worst that can happen is your machine goes through one more reboot for the year. Your machine, if it's a, since it's a Windows machine, it's gonna go through a few reboots anyway. And maybe a flipped bit shows up on your texture somewhere. For VR applications, gaming, even CAD modeling, I don't see a huge risk to overclocking a GPU. Even on the CPU side, it's getting pretty close to the same kind of deal. The voltage allowed for an Intel CPU, I think, is going up to 1.5 volts, minus, of course, whatever over voltage your motherboard's power supply might put in. But the normal running voltage for that CPU might be like 1.21 volts and pre-bend CPUs could give you 5.1 gigahertz on all cores at 1.315 volts for an i9 9900K CPU. So pre-binning and fairly easy overclocking because you have a large margin for additional voltage even with stock CPUs uh, just look into whether you might even be able to overclock your CPU, especially if you're in flight sim where VR applications tend to be running towards the limits of what today's CPUs can do. Also, for flight sim especially, consider disabling hyperthreading. It is now known to have a severe impact on applications like TCS World. Offline working backup. It costs you like four hundred dollars. You need you might need another solid state disk. You might need another Windows license. You might need another license for your flight sim application, like DCS World or whatever VR applications you're interested in, that can run offline. And you might need an enclosure, a bit of cabling, an adapter that might cost you hundred bucks total. That's four hundred bucks on thousands of dollars of hardware to make sure that when the software side gets updated over the internet that you have a backup that you can compare with. You can work with that if your VR application doesn't really need you to be connected to the internet. Like if you're just doing um, single player missions in DCS world, then at least you have a backup to go to. As a small addition to this video, I think it needs to be pointed out that the instability of Steam VR is such that yet another set of changes brought on by updates actually delayed the release of this video and obstructed the ability to get high frame rate footage into this video. On any particular issue with Steam VR, I always feel like it could be argued that 
well, I'm doing something wrong or something I'm doing is more complicated than most users would be doing. However, I am fairly good at getting this kind of technology to work. And if it cost me hours per week to fix Steam VR problems or things are at least correlated to Steam VR on a regular basis, that's a general problem that needs to be solved. Also, architecturally, I don't quite understand why it seems to be a good idea for the Steam VR pipeline to take apparently complicated two-dimensional or three-dimensional data uh, from overlay applications. I think it would be a better idea for programs like OVR Drop to be able to simply send transparent 2D frame buffer images directly to the headset and let that be composited in, in two dimensions and any position data from the headset be sent directly to the overlay application for it to handle that on its own. As an end user, there are a few specific ongoing nuisances with SteamVR at the moment. When I start SteamVR, in fact, when I start virtual desktop, usually through the hook that I have that replaces PyTools, PyVR home application, the SteamVR will pop up a little dialog that has to be dismissed using the hand controllers, which is a bit of an inconvenience because I have to turn on the flight controller, the uh, hand controllers. Then I could go into Flight Sim. It takes a somewhat annoyingly long amount of time to turn off the hand controllers, and it's likely I'll just forget and they'll just run out of battery, putting another cycle on the battery of the hand controllers for no good reason. Uh, if SteamVR is launched in offline mode, there will be a little prompt about whether I want to turn it back into online mode. Well, if I were running the machine headless, no displays attached, that could be a problem. I have, if I remember correctly, I've adapted a script that was written to rewrite the configuration file in SteamVR to make that nag disappear before launching SteamVR. But still, that, that just doesn't need to be there. Lack of true multitasking is another problem with SteamVR. If I remember correctly, towards the end of the time that I was still using Oculus CV1, it actually became possible to leave virtual desktop running in the background pull up the hand controller and switch to virtual desktop from another VR application. That may not have been the most efficient thing to do, but sometimes it was very useful. I think I was even able to use a keyboard shortcut to switch back and forth to virtual desktop, which was very efficient. Now, in fairness, the desktop overlays that are part of the Steam VR menu that can be brought up with the controllers have improved significantly, but they're still not perfect and they're not even close to being a substitute for a virtual desktop. I don't think they will be for a long time. And even if they were, there are several different types of virtual desktop apps. Each of them have their own strengths and weaknesses. My personal favorite for working for a long period of time in VR just using virtual monitors is VR Toolbox. It has the sharpest resolution. Uh, but virtual desktop is easily the best if you just need to get to a graphical console quickly. And it works every time, whether you have multiple monitors, however they're arranged, all that stuff. It's very quick. You don't have to move anything around with touch controllers. It just works in an instant. Uh, confirmation dialog has been showing up sometimes when programs like OVR Drop are launched with command line parameters, which obstructs the use of voice attack macros and things like that to launch OVR Drop panels and put them in just the right places. 
uh, for flight simulators and for Elite Dangerous and various other applications, that's particularly helpful because there's probably somewhere on the flight deck that is open space, that is a good place to put the OVR draw panel, and you don't want to have to move your panels around every time you make the panel appear and disappear. Recently, VRAM exhaustion has become enough of an issue that it's a good idea to actually close OVR drop entirely when possible. The understandable. I'm not defending Pimax here, I'm just pointing out a few data points that offer some frame of reference for the amount of time these headsets have taken to get to market. First, their Kickstarter was highly ambitious. At the time they announced that they would produce a high resolution, high field of view headset, the Oculus CV1 was still a competitive product. I was actually there at, at their booth at CES. It was a fairly limited demo, but it was still very impressive. I could tell that a lot of the optical problems that VR headsets were having, especially at that time, didn't really apply to their headsets. The screen door effect was already gone. At that time, the headset, I think, actually plugged into two separate display ports or two separate HDMI ports. So obviously things have come a long way since then. But the fact is they actually had working hardware and working headsets. Like this, like this now is a working headset today that is actually usable. That's, that's a tremendous success for any company doing a Kickstarter to have reached that milestone. Having spent time at HackDC, I was actually on the board of directors for HackDC, the capital hackerspace, for three years. I've met other people who were involved with Kickstarter on the other side. If you don't have any experience with Kickstarter as a seller, then it, it can be fairly difficult actually. There is a lot of people to manage. There's a lot of logistical issues to manage. It can cost you as much as you raise to do a Kickstarter. So keep in mind that it's actually a big deal for Pinax to have been able to get to this point. That shows that their company was actually able to get to this point. Also, in terms of what they've achieved, what other company out there is producing a consumer wide field of view headset? I'm not aware of it. The only thing I'm aware of that even comes close to being a competitor to this Pimax Vision 8KX is the HP Reverb. And I'm not enthusiastic about going back to having blinders on in my peripheral vision if I can avoid it. I'm not enthusiastic about the narrow field view, though I am curious to see if the HP Reverb has even roughly about the same uh, optical clarity or whether it's closer to an 8K plus. Still, that's it. Where are the other competitors? Where are companies like Oculus? I realize, of course, that Oculus is a small part of Facebook and companies like Valve may have thinner margins than I would intuitively expect. In general, businesses can have smaller operations than I would expect. But Pimax is a very small company as far as I can tell. On the US side, I don't see that many different people posting to the forums from Pimax officially. So they've done, they've done something amazing for a small company. Lastly, coronavirus. Yes, I can see how some people might have viewed the resulting delays to Pimax products as yet another delay in a long series of delays that Pimax has failed to meet their own schedule, etc. I don't agree with any of that. What's happening with this is unfortunately a very unique situation. The cost to people's hopes and dreams, even people's health all over the world is going to be tragic. This, this affects everybody, especially manufacturing companies in any country. 
uh, manufacturing companies, people can't just work from home and operate injection molding machines, at least not all of them. Additionally, I think it's worthwhile to point out that rushing anything will only endanger people and product. Pimax, I think, deserves tremendous credit for the way they handled the recent problems with a few of the artisan units that they shipped. Apparently, they attempted to rush production by using older methods of manufacturing the enclosures. Some of those had quality control defects and Pimax committed to not doing that in the future and using only their more advanced, fully automated process in the future. Okay, how to start DCS World using the spreadsheets as checklist. First, I'm going to open the spreadsheet, then I'm going to open PyTool, then I'm going to check that the settings match what's on the spreadsheet, or at least is close enough. Uh, panel mode DSC, that would set the refresh rate. In my case, the refresh rate is going to be 60 hertz. It'd be 75 hertz by default for the final version, probably. But anyway, I've done some tricks. I have my headset running at 60 hertz. And now I'm going to check the other settings. Smart smoothing on. Smart smoothing is on according to the spreadsheet. I do not have fixed foveated rendering turned on. It does impose a bit of a CPU trade-off, so I turn that off often. Parallel projections are off, as the spreadsheet says. Live only game is not needed. Field of view is normal, which is what I prefer. Hidden area mask is on. Generally, I haven't seen a performance regression with that, so it's a good idea to turn it on. It seems to hide some problems. Render quality 1.25, render quality 1.25, and that one is actually important. So I go ahead and apply that. Next, I would check SteamVR settings. Well, you can see that the vertical resolution is 2736 pixels, which is a little bit larger than the resolution in the spreadsheet, so that's correct. I would set app custom resolution, but one nuisance with SteamVR is that if you're not running DCS World, since it's not something in my SteamVR library, it's not in there for me to set it. For now, I'm just going to assume that that's correct because I tend to move the VR settings files around with batch scripts. But if you're not doing that, you may have to run the application and check that you've set that correctly. Now I would just run one of my batch files, which is going to, among other less important things, it's going to start voice attack and joystick gremlin with the correct profile. So that will give me the correct controls for my joystick. And it will also start at my voice recognition settings. Rapid complete. And now I start DCS. Okay, quick Elite Dangerous startup tutorial. If that is SteamVR, it doesn't have yet another problem. 
been having quite a few in the last hour. All right, so first we start the correct spreadsheet. I'm using this one for my higher quality settings. I'm using 60 hertz mode these days, so I'll go ahead and update that. Next, I will launch PyTool. I'm going to make sure that the settings in my spreadsheet, which is a checklist, match what is currently set in PyTool. Panel mode is DSC, which at the moment means that I'm running at 60 hertz, so that matches the 60 hertz refresh rate in the spreadsheet. Smart smoothing is turned on, as the spreadsheet says. Parallel projections are turned on, as the spreadsheet says. Vive only is turned off, as the spreadsheet says. Also, fixed foveated rendering is turned off, as the spreadsheet says. Field of view is normal. The spreadsheet has that written in there, but I could change that if I wanted to. Hidden area mask, turn that on. Generally, it's a good idea to use the hidden area mask. It doesn't seem to cost any performance anymore, and it can hide some artifacts. Render quality is 1.25. Generally, keeping render quality above 1.25 should reduce blur. SteamVR video custom resolution, at least 40, 50 vertical pixels. So we go to SteamVR settings, and we check that we have at least 40, 50 vertical pixels. Actually, 4128 is a little high, but I'm going to leave that because I know it's not going to cause any problems. The application resolution, 3206. Normally I would go to video for application settings. I would look for Elite Dangerous. And this is actually incorrect, but that's fine because I should be looking for Elite Dangerous 64.exe. But I can't because I'm not running it. If things don't seem to perform well, I can go back and change that later. Okay, so now I'm going to make sure that I've started the appropriate profile for Joystick Gremlin, which runs the keyword bindings for my hands-on throttle and stick setup. And I will also launch the correct voice attack profile so I get my voice recognition macros for Elite Dangerous. Rapid complete. Now I should be good to actually launch Elite Dangerous. Switch them. Switch them. Okay, footage and general commentary of what the experience is like of using a Pimax Vision AKX. Uh, Something that's come up on the forums is what it would look like to watch movies through the Pimax AKX. And describing this, I'm going to assume that you were watching something with a lot of detail and not something that is like 40p could be put on a small display. For that, you want high resolution and wide field of view. Wide field of view is kind of obvious. You want to see the entire frame in the headset without moving your head around because if you're only looking at part of the frame, by the time you move your head around, you're onto the next frame so you can't absorb the entire image as easily if you have to move your head instead of just your eyes. High resolution, 
with lower resolution, such as with the 5K+, Plus, it would be more tempting to try and create a larger screen than you would use for the same purpose in physical displays. And that's, that's a good way to get back to the earlier problem of having to look around because you are not seeing the entire frame in the display all at once. One thing the AKX definitely improves on greatly that it's relevant to movie watching is color quality. The 5K Plus was rather hard on the eyes for even movie watching just because the colors were fairly off. The AKX is a lot better in that regard. One of the remaining drawbacks of VR even with the Pimax Vision AKX being that it's somewhat less comfortable than looking at a physical computer screen applies much less to watching movies. Even if it's fairly interesting, even if you're trying to analyze a fairly complicated set of scenery, it's not going to require as much concentration as doing desk work usually does. It's not going to be quite as hard on the eyes as reading text. So in general, it's going to be a more relaxing experience. I think that many of the people who would not be very willing to grab a laptop and use the uh, Pimax Vision AKX for desk work while they're on the move would be much more able and willing to consider doing that for watching movies. I can, I can see somebody using a laptop and a AKX. Now, what is it like to use virtual desktop or similar applications in the Pimax Vision AKX? Well, there is no substitute for seeing it in person, but I will try to describe it. There is rarely any screen door or pixelation. The closest things get to being unreadable on my screen is the clock in the taskbar, in general, the taskbar text that Windows presents. Now, when I look at my Linux desktop through VNC in full screen, that's not the case. There isn't any text that is anywhere close to being that small on my Linux desktop. In general, the text is much better balanced there. There isn't anything that I encounter outside of the Windows OS that even approaches being unreadable. The sort of glitches, the graphical problems that the 5K Plus tends to have are almost absent in virtual desktop. That said, just because things are readable doesn't mean that they are comfortably readable. The clock widget, the tax, taskbar text in the Windows OS is not particularly comfortable to read under any set of conditions that I would set the virtual the desktop application to render at for all other purposes. Most other things are fairly comfortable to read with some exceptions that are usually a result of either the way the virtual displays are positioned or the way the virtual desktop application works. Case in point, virtual desktop itself, if I have a triple monitor workstation, then everything at the center is comfortable and readable, but looking at the left or the right monitors, the well, virtual desktop wants to put everything onto a single screen, which is very helpful for minimizing configuration time when you just need to get to your graphical console quickly. It's not quite as helpful if you want everything to be comfortably readable because you'll look at the far left edge of your left display which is likely where you would put, which is likely where you would launch applications from. And 
things are not going to be quite as readable because it's going to be at not quite the right angle and it's going to be a little further away. It's pretty easy to compensate for that by setting the virtual distance of the screen to 0.6 meters or so, and then you can lean in just a little bit and read things pretty easily. But of course, if you do that long enough, then that incurs a little bit of neck ache. Uh, VR Toolbox gets around that. It is super sharp. Even the Windows taskbar text gets to the point that things like the zero have absolutely no sort of crossover from white pixels to black pixels and vice versa. Um, VR Toolbox you can place virtual screens wherever you want them. You can set the sharpening filter to your preference. There are a lot of great things about virtual toolbox that make it one of the best experiences, but often you do have to move the displays around and create them yourself. So it depends on what you're doing. The experience is close to a monitor. I would say that the resolution is at least within 20% of a monitor for practical purposes. There is usually a little bit more blur. That could be due to the lenses on this pre-production unit that's been through CES and everything else, having just a little bit more wear on them. In general, if you have optics and you get any kind of abrasive on them, then it starts to get just slightly cloudy long before there are any visible scratches or anything. I don't think there's any significant damage to these lenses though, and after what they've been through, at CES, there was no concern about asking people to really even be careful about not getting their uh, glasses, some pretty egregious forms of glasses, contacting the displays directly and rubbing against them and all sorts of things happening. Not to mention the displays where the lenses were getting frequently cleaned off for various reasons. It was pretty rough on the hardware to say the least. And it's not much of a change in the behavior of the headset. If there's any blur caused by the lenses, it's less than the blur caused by the Steam VR filter. So remember to set render quality to 1.25 or greater. Generally, it's excellent. I think that at this point, resolution and field of view, the performance of the headset is no longer the limiting factor on using it as a replacement for a monitor. For me, the weight of the headset, having it physically there, having what probably amounts to a sense of heat and humidity under the headset, the, the general aspects of being comfortable wearing the headset, um, it's not as comfortable as just looking at a computer screen. And that's the, that's the biggest drawback, not the resolution, not the field of view, which you're getting very close to, if not directly competitive with most people's computer monitor setups. To be clear, the comparison that I'm making between the headset and monitors is directly between the Pimax Vision 8KX and a 65 inch 4K display at about two to three feet distant. So I, th I think that's a pretty fair comparison. The angular resolution is pretty close to having a 1080p monitor that's at about the same distance and about 23 inches across, which actually is what I'm looking at right now. One thing I don't think I need to provide any of my own footage for really is through the lens photos. I have taken a few with a smartphone camera, but really Sweet Viber has done an amazing job on this. I can look at what he's done. I can see that the pixels around the text that he's photographing are exactly as I have seen them through the AKX and other headsets that he's done that with. 
So at least for the current AKX photos he's done of things like virtual desktop, I can just certify he's done it exactly right. That's exactly what it looks like. Now, the sense of scale as to exactly what size that text is, it's hard for through the lens photos to really give that impression. But in terms of whether the text is blurry or clear, his photos do an excellent job of showing that. In fact, much of the expectations I had before I had the chance to see an AKX headset and everything it can do was very well informed by the work that Sweetbiver did with those photos. So good work for him. And I'm just signing off on that is, those are accurate results. So you don't really need anything from me, but I can just say, yep, that's correct. The FA-18 in DCS world. The HUD is absolutely clear. There's barely any pixelation at all. I can kind of see it, but I have to look for it, and it's not a regular pattern. Like if I rotate the headset so that the horizon line is just almost exactly lined up with the pixels and the display, then I can kind of see that there's a little bit of jaggedness to them, but there isn't really any screen door effect. The AMPCD down here, the color display on the movie map, I can look right, right at this and I can see 70 true, zero ground speed, even with the map turned on. With the map turned off, of course, switch them. Switch them. Switch them. With the map turned off, this display, of course, is even more readable. There isn't anything in this cockpit that isn't readable. The altitude display, I can see the 2992 number there. I can read the altimeter itself perfectly. The radar altimeter is clear enough that I can read this in a hurry. Everything here is completely readable. Even the knee board is actually readable. Knee board 10 forward. Like I can actually read OBOX console switch off, OBOX flow knob off. I can actually read this knee board here. So yeah, the F-A-18 in DCS World gets very high marks for readability. A little bit of tearing, it might not show up in the video. The speed and altitude numbers tear a little bit while turning onto the runway. It's not really a problem in flight. It tends to show up more on the ground. Looking over the wing, it's amazing to see the F-A-18 in this kind of detail. Landing gear. Flaps up. Flaps up. Flight controls. Flight controls. Oh, right.
right, turn right. I think I forgot to use the correct profile for my recorder application OBS, so the frame rate might be terrible. There should probably be a list of memes for all the things that it's possible to mess up in the VR software stack. Airbrake engage. Flaps down. Flaps down. Landing gear. Airbrake engage. Wheel brake. Air brake engage. Wheel brake. Undesignate. Wheel brake. Air brake engage. Air brake cancel. Wheel brake. Wheel brake. Wheel brake. And again, yes, it is definitely more immersive to see these aircraft in higher resolution. Wheel brake. Undesignate. Wheel brake. Wheel brake. Undesignate. 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 Wheel brake. Wheel brake. Recorder stop. Back. Recorders. Switch them. Switch them. Okay, the FA-18C and DCS world. First, we'll start with what is pixelated. The trees in the background, there's a little bit of pixelation around their edges. The runway, there's a little bit of pixelation around its edges. Some of the runway lines are a little bit pixelated towards the edge, like these. Zoom. Those tend to be pixelated when I'm looking at them not through zoom or enough of a distance. Also, there's a little feature on the side of that hangar over there. Zoom. That, hor that horizontal line tends to get a little pixelated. These are all almost certainly graphical glitches. Now, as for what isn't pixelated, what is extremely readable, the HUD. There's 
a tiny hint of jagged edges, which I can see a lot better because of the time I've spent in the headset, but it's, it is vastly superior to the 5K Plus or any other headset that I've tried. Anyone who has tried the AKX at the Roadshow or at CES says the same thing. This AMPCD, even with this map displayed, which itself looks a lot better than it usually does, I can clearly and immediately read 70 true airspeed, zero ground speed. I can just glance down, know how fast I'm going, and then look back up. Without the map, of course, it's even more clear, but there's no need to turn off the map most of the time like there used to be. Also, the map features themselves are a lot more useful, it's a lot more readable. Okay, here's a good example of something that is barely readable. These knobs around here, where it says other position, steer, waypoint, those letters are relatively difficult to read in the AKX simply because they're blurred together. That represents about the limits of readability in cockpit instrumentation. Most things here are nonetheless very readable. That's, that's pretty much the exception. The HUD is especially clear. There's no pixelation on this HUD. It actually looks better than the F-A-18 HUD. Here's another example of something that is just not quite readable because of unusual illumination or text conditions. The caution lights in this AV-8B Harrier. Looking at this panel here, I can just see that the bottom one says yaw and the others are not really readable. Zoom. Zoom. Switch sim. Switch sim. Zoom. Zoom. Everything in the F-16 cockpit is completely readable. No surprises there. The HUD of the F-16 in particular is especially amazing in the AKX. There's no visible screen door effect. There's just the tiniest hint of jagged edges. It's actually considerably better than the HUD of the F-18. Well, not generally, of course, but just in terms of how well it renders in the AKX headset. It's a perfectly rendered HUD. Switch sim.
Recorder stop. Back. Recorder stop. Switch them. Now the clarity of that text right there is absolutely amazing, unbelievable. Okay, now I'm going to construct sim FFB. I'm basically going to tell voice attack to run a little program that makes my joystick a little bit stiffer. Construct sim FFB. And that's it, Elite Dangerous has started up. Right from the menu, we can see a few things. There is severe pixelation on the deck under the ship. That might not show up in the video, but it's definitely a bug. It's in contrast to everything else being super sharp, having no screen door whatsoever, having no jagged edges at all. It's just that that, these little pipes on the side of the ship, a few other features on the bottom of the ship, nothing on the roof seems to be pixelated. Uh, I am seeing a little bit of pixelation on the yellow paint that's on the landing pad as I look out towards the entry there. Although another odd thing about Elite Dangerous is that runway paint seems to float in midair sometimes. So yeah, there there are some bugs and every possible combination of anti-aliasing and NVIDIA control panel, all that doesn't seem to help. Increasing super sampling helps, but obviously you can only push that so far and this is about as high as it goes. Now, what really matters in terms of clarity and Elite Dangerous is looking at the text, at least to me, looking at the text, looking at the flight deck and not seeing a whole bunch of haze everywhere. Like looking at this, it's super sharp text. Incoming very message. Very pleasant to read, very pleasant to look at. This here also looks excellent. The stars all look great. And once again, as for black level, let's see, where's a decent patch of black? Probably still pretty close to the bubble. Well, I'm not going to find uh, pitch black. Yeah, actually that area there looks pitch black. So yeah, pitch black looks pitch black. I can't see any gray. Everything around me is bright enough that I wouldn't see that. The HUD text here, uh, there is just a little bit of pixelation in that COM panel on the lines. There are a couple of lines at the top and bottom of the menu icons of the uh, com panel and the HUD and I do see just a little bit of pixelation there but otherwise this is absolutely clear there's one of the worst things about the older headsets was the amount of haze there are also none of the Fresnel lens rays effects nothing in here is really bright enough to create that effect so it just looks crystal clear it even looks clear out to the edges of the display I have to get Let's see, yeah, I have to get at least a third of the way away from the sweet spot of the lenses before I start to notice any degradation. However, this is also a good demo of the sensitivity of Pimax headsets to optical alignment. If I push it, if I push it off by even this much, less than, less than a millimeter and a half, then things start to get fuzzy. So keep in mind that optical alignment is important and that's part of the reason why they work better for 85% of people than they do for the remaining 15%. I'm looking for stuff that I might remark on as not being particularly crisp or having some sort of defect I'm not really finding anything. The only things that I see any pixelation on at all are things that clearly Elite Dangerous had some rendering bugs with. So yeah, it's amazing. And this is at, let me check the spreadsheet. 
Construct panel. Act construct panel. Destruct panel. Construct work in VR. Act construct work in VR. So we can see from the spreadsheet that the in-game total super resolution is almost 1.5, which is really good. Here we see the higher resolution doesn't so much negate the need for a telescopic zoom. There are a few more things of note about the Pimax Vision AKX headset. Uh, the modified strap works pretty well for me. Uh, it does something similar to what the AKX does. By clamping this part of the strap here, it helps ensure that more of the pressure is put on the top part of the face instead of being put on the nose where there's less surface area. The foam used on this AKX, it's an amazing material. I don't know if it is, but it feels like it might be Teflon coated. It's a very soft material. It's a very porous material. It's much more porous than the material that was used for the original 5K plus foam. Uh, it's slick. It's low friction in some way. So that's, that's a pretty nice feature. There was a leather face pad at CES. My experience with that was very brief. There may be other face pads and development. Um, my perception was that that was a bit too thin. I would only use that if I was doing lots of very intense room scale stuff for the same reason that I use a leather cover for the uh, 5K plus. The uh, comfort kit itself uses supposedly a rubber, supposedly this big rubber interface here is compatible with the older one used for the 5K Plus. So you could use a VR cover that was made for the Vive just as you could with the older headsets if you swapped it out. You probably could even use a VR cover with the existing foam. I just haven't tried those options yet because I'm not trying to mess things up. I'm focused on using this headset. I wouldn't recommend uh, using VR cover products on these comfort kits anyway. The comfort kits are a major improvement as it is. That said, the ongoing compatibility with the larger ecosystem of aftermarket products is a brilliant technical decision on the part of Pimax. Uh, another thing to note that is specific to this unit, uh, a few things to note actually. The lenses on this unit, which is not a final unit, it's been to CES, the roadshows and everything, the lenses do seem just a little more fuzzy than the lenses on the Pimax 5K Plus. By understanding is that optically they're supposed to be exactly the same lenses, I suspect that these lenses did take a bit of a wear at CES and Rochos. However, there's only one tiny scratch on one of the lenses. It would barely show up if I shine a light on it and there's no defect from that specific scratch. So I don't think it's scratched. I think there just may be some tiny amount of wear on those lenses. 
I'd swap them with the lenses that I have and my old Pimax 5K Plus just to see, but again, I'm not taking risks, and it's not really a big issue. If anything, it just makes certain edges on some text just a tiny bit sharper. It's nothing compared to the blur filter that SteamVR can impose, which I do use a 1.25 render quality at all times to overcome. Uh, but that does come with its own artifact, which may be why the blur filter exists. The volume button, let me see one of these buttons. Um, yeah, the volume up button on this AKX has a little bit less tactical feel and noticeably, notably it's not, uh, it doesn't lose its tactile feel until after a at least one or two presses, which suggests to me that while the headset was out on the Rocho, some tiny bit of some sticky juice or something got in there, and maybe somebody's drink was on their hands or something, and that did that. Doesn't really affect it at all. I couldn't care less. Uh, Refresh rate, I typically operate this at 60 hertz. So I've used it at 60 hertz, I've used it at 70 hertz. I, I mean, I've used it at 75 hertz, not 75, not 70 hertz, but 75 hertz. And uh, it, it's not that much of a difference. The There is a huge advantage to 60 hertz though, which is that it often lines up very nicely with the refresh rates for two-dimensional monitors with the capture rates for OVR drop, of course. If I end up with any kind of double framing due to smart smoothing, that benefit is lost. But when things do line up, it's there's really no jitter to it. It's it's actually nice to have the 60, 60 hertz mode instead of the 64 hertz mode that I was accustomed to with the 5K+. Plus. On rare occasion, when I start up the headset, and this probably applied to the 5K Plus as well, I would get severe latency, like I'd have an extra frame of latency and well, actually more like an extra 30 hertz frame. So what's that like? Um, one divided by 30 is... Yeah, 30, 30 milliseconds, that's what I thought. So an extra 30 milliseconds of latency. It was bad enough I wouldn't want to tolerate it. Usually I just rebooted the computer when that happened. That seems to have gone away. The trick seems to have been to make sure the lighthouses are started up before the computer is started. Probably this is a lighthouse 1.0 issue. It may have nothing to do with the headset at all. And maybe not Pimax maybe not Lighthouse 2.0. doesn't really matter. It's just rumor to have the Lighthouses turned on. Another interesting thing that Pimax users in general probably already know is that you don't need to worry about needing to regain your VR legs. You're not going to get a greater sense of VR motion sickness as a result of the wide field of view. It's, it's about the same experience. And if you've already gotten used to it, that's the way it is. Native resolution wireless. Just, I want to mention that this is something that some people seem interested in. To be honest, I just don't care. Pimax may come out with that capability. They may not. I, I just don't care. I'm, I'm going to be, when I'm doing flight sim, it's not a problem. I can hook up the cable where it's not going to be hitting anything, making noise. It's not going to be trying to make me or back. It's just not something I really care about. Clean. Um, it's a good idea from time to time, preferably with the headset off, but you can do it with the headset on, to get a paper towel, fold it up a bunch of times, get a part of it wet, soak into the top part of the comfort kit foam, and then get a dry paper towel and soak that up. Just 
it takes minutes to do and it can help maybe every few days maybe once a week it depends on how much you use the headset of course if you're doing intense room scale stuff with this phone with the headset uh, then you might want to either clean it or you might want to use the leather uh, pad when or if that becomes available. Okay, so as a last little bit of information to wrap this up, uh, some information about myself and what I'm working on, a lot of which is kind of related to this. Uh, in VR myself, I tend to use a very sophisticated setup. One of the latest additions to that is what I call a panel board, and that's, the, uh, that's actually what I call the software for it. The, Panel VM itself is sort of the implementation of that. So that's a Gen 2 Linux a virtual machine, which just has the basic applications I need. Uh, Ocular for PDFs, external for editing PDFs, for drawing things, KWrite for text editing, as, and as a sort of a scratch pad for writing things down, a few other things. And it's set up so that it works more like Atom Text Editor than most, than most desktop computer interfaces people would be familiar with. So on one side of the display, the file manager will be open. And of course, this is Linux, so I can use KDE Dolphin File Manager, which is really nice because of the expandable folder feature. I've always been looking for a way to get under the Microsoft Windows platform, and I can't. But anyway, I can look, I can browse a very large, very complicated folder tree as easily as I would browse post-it note sticky tabs put on a physical paperback book. And then I can click the file that I want to open. I can click another file that I want to open, single click to open files, of course. Then I can click the original file that I opened previously, and the software will automatically arrange all the windows so it's the file manager stays in its dedicated little panel, and the documents are open in the other little panel. And when I go back to the original application, it opens it actually brings to focus the window that was already open with that document as opposed to closing the window and launching a new document or ending up with yet another taskbar entry on the machine to manage. So it's a very quick way to get something like a kneeboard in VR that is as efficient as paper, but with the advantages of being able to search things like being able to look at an HTML web page uh, offline or online and search for something like a control binding in DCS world so I can create some of the complicated joystick uh, profiles that I use and the voice recognition profiles that I use to control those kinds of things. Also, I have set up a new spot on Patreon. I'm hoping to gather some technology enthusiasts there, though everything is still very much a work in progress. Uh, technology first, though, documentation if justified. I'm not becoming a YouTube pro, but if people sign up there and provide some feedback, that will help guide whether I spend more of my time continuing to finish some of these technology projects that I'm working on or whether I stop and document some of what I've done and how to use them. On the hardware side, I personally will be selling the computer that I'm currently using for VR when the next generation CPU and GPU come out. That's not because it's becoming obsolete, but my use cases 
do push things to the limit. On the CPU side, I would like to improve the margins for particularly complicated flight sim scenarios like running the 476 Netter mission before DCS world itself becomes more inefficient because more features were added or before some performance regressions happen anywhere in the pipeline or even before there are even more complicated things that I want to work with. On the GPU side, the biggest benefit I see from the next generation GPUs is probably VRAM. They might give a 30% boost in clock speed over what we have from the overclocked, overclocked 2080 Ti's we can buy currently. Um, current 2080 Ti's can already do the job but I do have some reliability issues doing things like launching OVR drop panels, which appears to be caused by VRAM exhaustion. One thing that's particularly interesting about this is that this may be the last air-cooled machine in this performance category. From what I've read, it looks like the next generation CPU, the i9 10900K CPU, is going to push beyond 300 watts when it's clocked to its full capabilities. That's, that's gonna be hard to do, even with this CPU cooler that I have that can apparently handle about 200 watts before this CPU starts thermal throttling. And on top of that, just being able to get cooler temperatures means that water cooling is probably less of a hassle for me anyway just i do i already have a water cooled cpu for my linux workstation and going that route for the vr workstation is probably going to make it less maintenance intense not more because of that one of my future projects is very likely to be designing a custom uh, a custom desktop PC case that will emphasize things like an external port to fill and drain it with an external pump for ease of use and also to use that same port for externally chilling the computer. Uh, again, consider signing up for my Patreon account. might help give me some direction as to where I should go with this. Uh, a few other projects, though, are related to the Pimax headset itself. One of the things I'm thinking of doing, I'm not doing it with this headset yet because replaceability, but I'm thinking that this headset itself would probably be a little bit more comfortable if there were a few vent holes, like one here, here, and here, uh, put in with a drill press punching all the way through so this isn't just a huge flat area on the face, but so that there's actually some uh, way for air to get out for, for it to be a little bit cooler. Uh, along the same lines, I'm thinking I might put together a dumb USB-C hub so that you can connect to the, I think there's one, I think there are two USB-C ports. But in any case, there's a USB-C port on the bottom and having power on the headset means that that would be a great way to attach blower fans. Maybe a blower fan could blow in through the sides, which apparently are made for people's eyeglasses or even through these small vent holes on the bottom. Also, it might be an interesting idea to add a Bluetooth transmitter somewhere on the modular audio strap so that if you are just working from your desktop, you don't need to be in the VR headset, but you need to put together something like joystick gremlin profiles or you need to diagnose something in the uh, for VR application software stack, then you can still hear the audio. That would probably be especially useful for users of voice recognition software so they can hear the confirmation beeps that the voice command was recognized correctly. A few other projects that I have are things like the extended interface project, 
which right now has become a repository for a whole bunch of profiles for controlling practically every uh, aircraft in DCS world, um, for controlling Elite Dangerous and some other various video games. Uh, it's a general project to contain all the things that you would need to get things like simulation apps working. So take a look at that.